Secrets of Raising the 21st Century Child. Oh, child. Oh, child. I, I know this one being because my mom had five kids. And in having five kids, we were all different personalities. I'm just having a, you know, I remember um, walking down the streets, uh, bare-breasted. I was still a child. I read this book. And the way she would read the book was in a way that I had never heard before. I'd, I'd never heard anybody read and create this image and picture in your mind. And I was like, wow, there. But of course, the white people, they would not allow me to just stay there because who am I? So I would stay in the servants' quarters 24 seven, hiding in the bunk bed. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. It's Top Shamas once again with another interesting video. Guys, today I thought because we are wrapping up the year at school and in general life we are wrapping up the year, um, just to share with you some books that I've read this year. Okay, um, some of them have been for obviously my work at school. But um, I have others that I just read occasionally throughout the year. Okay, so let's begin. By the way, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. I've, I've seen the stats. You guys watch, you don't subscribe, don't like, don't comment. Three, two, one, <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> anyway, guys. Uh, let's start with the book reviews it's not a book review really it's just dingy to share the books that i've read and speak on them uh when prompted to and i'll share some of the books that have made a difference in my life that have really you know stuck with me since okay right so the first one that we are going to okay let me start with um at school at school, we did four types of uh, authors, okay? We did American, we did British, we did South African, and we did Indian, okay? So we did those um, four um, regional, let me say, um, authors. So I'm going to start with the Indian. This one was called Fasting Feasting. I just printed it. Um, I couldn't get it anywhere and I didn't have time, you know, to to look for it on take a lot and stuff like that. So I just printed it because they gave it to us. This is an Indian author, Anita Desai. I really, really, I really enjoyed this book because it speaks to, um, you know, people who leave their country to find riches elsewhere in first world countries right so but this is from an indian perspective um and i'm sure a lot of africans can relate a lot of middle easterns can relate a lot of just ethnic people can relate you know in the great search of the first world dream you know so um anita desai in this book uh, gives us her perspective in the Indian community, right? So we did um, Fasting Feasting by Anita Desai. And I'm going to put up here Silver Roofs and Golden Pavements. I also didn't get that one, um, but I'll put it up here. Um, it was a short story. It was also kind of the same narrative, you know, of Indians leaving their, their, their home to find better riches in first world countries, okay? So this one uh, was by Chitra, Di <laughs> Chitra Divakaruni. I, I hope I didn't chop up her name. 
Um, it was also a very nice, relatable uh, book of, you know, people looking for riches. Um, you know, when you speak with people, especially where I am in South Africa, a developing country, um, a lot of South Africans are feeling very dissatisfied with where they are now in life, career-wise, money-wise, financially, and stuff like that. And they are looking to travel so that they can um, live the American dream or South African dream by going out and finding riches elsewhere. So it's very relatable in that way. Okay, so that was the two Indian authors that we did. Then I'm going to move on to South African authors. We did running and other stories. This is a compilation by Makosa Zane e Kaba of short stories. And we read three short stories, as you can see here. And each of the three stories are sort of like a continuation of the original story. It is so cleverly made because um, the original story was made and then another author decided, okay, let me give the opinion of the, um, of the, like from the original story, right? Um, let me give the perspective of the one character from that story. Because we were left kind of feeling, oh my gosh, you know, what drove her to this? What drove, you know, what happened? What happened? So then another author decided, let me give the perspective of the one character. Then another one was written, the third one, to give the perspective of the other character. So it's a husband and wife kind of situation. And then uh, one author decided, let me give the wife's perspective. And then the other one decided to give the husband's perspective, of course, with other characters. And then um, it is so cleverly written if you read all three of these short stories together because it, it, it's, you know, fascinating, intriguing, interesting, and also um, just gives you a perspective of life. So I really enjoyed these three short stories and everything. There's more short stories, of, of course, but because, you know, for the course we had to read these three, that's where I read. But I will take time during the holidays because, I mean, we open in February, so there's a lot of time for us to read. So I'm going to be obviously reading other short stories by Makosa Zanikaba. She's a brilliant author. So that was the first South African. Oh, this one. 13 cents, 13 cents by Deka, Selo Deka. Hey, boy. Guys, I dropped the book because that's how many times I dropped the book in real life. <laughs> you know, when you read, when you read this book, make sure, Oguti, you are in your most soberest mind and the most open mind because the things that are in this book will just break your heart the things that are in this book it's a real story unfortunately and the author committed suicide due to the the things that he had seen right from this and um it is gripping. It's the reality. The setting, of course, is in Cape Town. So he's just telling, uh, apparently he, um, he left his life and went to live on the streets of Cape Town. And he's just, and became a street child, right? And um, then he writes what he saw here. I mean... When I read the book, you feel every emotion possible, every emotion, right? And um, then there's a bit of imaginary work that happens, um, you know, with the main character and stuff like that. But that is just to escape the life that he's living in, you know. So I would definitely recommend this book. You know, but you just need to 
At times you just want to read and put it aside and just say, I just want to detox from this. I, I don't want to read this. And then you come back again. But um, yeah, 13 cents, definitely a must read. So those were the two South African authors that we read. Now we are going to go to the three American authors that we read. The first one is... The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Some of you may be familiar with Toni Morrison because she's written some books. That, she's written some books that are quite popular. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, The Bluest Eye is amazing. Amazing. You know, American authors, obviously, they never disappoint because, I don't know, maybe it's because we're so exposed to the American things, you know um but and we and we feel like we relate to some of it but definitely definitely Toni Morrison a good author a lovely book I wouldn't mind reading this one again we read three American authors so we went then to the known world okay this is um you know uh, about slavery and stuff like that um and also about just African Americans owning slaves and stuff like that. It is a very nice book. This is a book that I'd love to read again because I didn't quite read it the way that I was supposed to. And my essay mark shows it. <laughs> but definitely we'll read this one again because it is just gobsmacking. You know, it's 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 like whew. and you know, it's these uh, books that are heavy. For me, I don't know about you guys, but for me, anytime I watch uh, things about injustice and slavery and all of that, putting, you know, it, it it's just heavy, you know. But the perspective that is in this book is very uh, mind-opening. So it's The Known World by Edward Jones and it won a prize. So any book that wins a prize for me is always uh, a sign. Okay, then the last American author is The Parable of the Sower. Kind of the same theme. Um, uh, I liked it. Okay, I liked it by Octavia Butler. And um, I would read this again. But it would probably be, you know, at the bottom of the rack to read again. But I would read this one again, definitely. Then we are busy. Or oh, we finished, actually with British authors Great Expectations was the book that we read um, by Charles Dickens and I just love this Charles Dickens Great Expectations I just love this book because it makes you think it makes you think about a number of topics in life it makes you think about patriarchy it makes you think about our expectations of life our expectations from people um it just it's deep i like it i really really do like it i'll definitely read this again um and there is a series a three a three-part series um just like the book is also three parts um, there's three episodes that you can watch and it is really really interesting then the last of the British was Open Water by Caleb this is also very interesting um, a British a young British author well I won't say young but it's a British author I think it's his first book um, and I really um, you know, Nelson gives the perspective of the black British. Uh, my lecture would say, if you think of Black Lives Matter, but in Britain, you know, just kind of like the issues they have to deal with in, in Britain. So this book is really, um, you know, it's based around a couple, a love relationship, between uh, this couple but definitely something i'm really proud of this this book for, for for first time author right so those are all the books that we did 
in varsity and I've had to read each and every one so you know that's why I like English because it's definitely going to improve my you know just in normal life we would just read like one or two books in the year but this forces me now to really be on my game and really read as much as I used to enjoy you know okay so because of that of course I have been getting books I just recently bought this one aromatherapy uh, if some of you know um, if some of you know me okay sorry if some of you know me you know that I am a, you know like a herbalist I like to make my own homemade facial care hair care and stuff like that so I recently got this at a secondhand book it's on aromatherapy and essential oils so it's just nice to have I've just recently started just looking at it not reading it because I'm heading towards exams then um Victorian people and ideas I just took this book also at the same secondhand uh, store because um it's nice to just have background when you read a book. Um, it's nice to be knowledgeable about certain eras so that you can get the background. For instance, when I read this one here, Great Expectations, it's nice to have known what was happening during that time, you know, in Britain um and also which authors were contemporary at the time which artists were contemporary at the time which philosophers were contemporary at the time and it sort of gives you a richer understanding of one the author and also what he's telling us about so i just bought this because a lot of books that we're probably going to do are you know um of England and America so um, understanding Victorian people and their ideas will give me a lot of background of things that were happening at that time just for information sakes of course I'd want to know um, the Victorian people and ideas in China of course they're not Victorian people but during that era because we've named that era as the Victorian era and whatever era so um, I'd like to just give myself a, a, a rounded um, knowledge of what was happening in the world during certain times of periods. So I've started reading this. I probably will get on with it um, during the holidays. Then I bought this. I'm a thrifter, okay? I like cheap things. This is by Juliet Barker, Woodsworth, A Life in Letters. It says, enjoyable, sympathetically selected and annotated, not to be missed. The Times Literally Supplement. That already tells you this is going to be a good read. So I just can't wait. I have, I'm, I'm not exposed to this author, but as you know, we, we want to know. So um, I'm, I'm going to be introduced to this author now. I will read this book soon. Then, hoo -hoo, I read this one, I think, last year, because I bought this last year. Uh, it's Conversations with My Sons and Daughters by Mampela Rampele. I love her so much. I enjoyed it. I think I read it till about the end. And then the end part, I read it in such a rush. Uh, so this year I've just been reading sections and sections of it again and just, you know, uh, underlining and whatever um, things that strike me, things that are making a difference um, to me, things that I need to note, but definitely a good read. So if you've got time, you can just be introduced to her work and her thoughts. Then <laughs> becoming... This book I think I bought two or three years ago, okay, and I could never finish it. I still haven't finished it, and <laughs> this year I've been trying to finish it. So, um, I will finish it. I will definitely finish it. But um, I think it's um, 
because we know her so well and the book has been spoken about so much i kind of know how, you know what's happening uh even though i've read maybe three quarters of it so i'll be finishing this then of course because we are parents it's a spiritual approach to parenting secrets of raising the 21st century child oh child oh child because being a parent is an extreme sport you need help and backup <laughs> so i just bought this you know because i i know this from me because my mom had five kids and in having five kids we were all different personalities and um, in having five kids, we were all different personalities. My sister, she was the ladylike, agreeable, understanding. My then my brother. Oh, then it was me. I'm the second born. Then it was my brother, uh, who was the first born son born among daughters he was so gentle he was the cutesy boy he was the everything um and he was spoiled because he was the first born son and on top of that he was just so cute and adorable and everything then it was my sister my youngest sister she was so bubbly she was so outgoing and uh, very lovable you know gets along with everyone just someone who's so social sociable right then it was my last born brother the one that passed away in march and he was just spoiled and he he got away with a lot because he was the last born <laughs> and um he was just so cute and we're all different personalities and of course me with my personality <laughs> I think out of all those children, I was the most challenging, guys. I was the most challenging. I questioned everything. And my mom was so gentle and so soft. And she just could, I think she just couldn't understand why she can, you know, give birth to a child who's so opposite to her, who questions everything, and who who who's who's I was a go-getter, you know. I, I wanted to do everything first. I wanted to drive, but I did drive I drove first. I, you know, I was just, to them, I'm sure it was like, this girl is so extreme because they they had my sister who was a lady. And then I was just like climbing trees. And so we we definitely need a different parenting because my sister was so gentle and soft. And then here I come, you know, I remember um, walking down the streets, uh, bare-breasted. I was still a child, uh, like like a little tomboy with my father you know, like his honorary son <laughs> around the streets and, uh, you know, getting up to just chilling, in, you know, you know, look, she in life, Clemente, you know, and walk the streets with um, and, you know, just greeting neighbors and doing stuff like that. So I'll be the one doing that with my dad. So I then grew up and I, I realized, was he, you know, when you have children, you you have to parent them differently. As hard as it, it is, because to the kids, it will then come across as though this one is your favorite because you are different with them. And with me, you are different. But you're just sharing the love in different ways, in the ways that maybe they need them, you know. Um, because I would speak with my kids do you want me to hug? Do you want me to say I love you every day and kiss you every day? And, you know, other kids would be like, well, that's disgusting. And others would be like, yes, I want, you know. So it's just nice to gauge and whatever. And maybe say that I love you in different ways because their love language is also different. I don't know if I'm making sense. But I just thought, okay, I would have liked that to have parenting based on who you are, really. So that I can speak your language I can speak to your soul in the way that you can understand. And I can also shout at you and discipline you in the way that you understand, you know. 
it is difficult because of course we are raised the way that we are raised and we sometimes repeat what what we did but at least we try to change <laughs> you know and i always say with me i don't know but i feel like especially uh you know when the kids get on in age uguti love is a two way street just because you're my child it doesn't mean that uh I'm supposed to suffer for everything and be the one giving everything. It's a two-way street. You have to give me that love and appreciation and respect and I will in turn give you. Then it becomes a relationship of, you know, yet giving me the space of also being a mom to you, you know. So give me the space to vent and shout when I need to so that I can straighten you up and also um we then talk about other things but if you are not forthcoming and coming to speak uh then there's not really much I can do for you you know um so a lot of the parents here will be saying things like kids need to understand that we are not going to die on that cross because we are your parents you know it's a two way relationship that needs to be nurtured both ways uh i know that one parent in here was talking about you know if i don't check up on my kids my kids will never check up on me and i feel like okay, i have to check on them because i'm their mom and when you look at their ages you're like no it's a two way thing because she was like sometimes i feel like maybe they don't love me but when i speak to them they do it's just that they forget and whatever because they're old and whatever but she was trying to get a backbone to tell her kids if you're not going to phone me i'm not going to phone you it's a two way thing it's a two way relationship you need to check up on me what if something happens to me and we are not talking you know and the relationship is based on me phoning you because i'm your mom i'm still bearing the cross with i'm your mom so you know there's you 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 learn a lot of things from other parents and uh the way that they parent and then obviously the author's voice um who then speaks psychologically about certain situations uh so that you know to help us but i find this a very very helpful book for parents who just want to know who would see especially if your kids are getting on in age i mean i'm talking about 10 11 12 going up because they start to 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 be having their own opinions about life and things you know i saw another tiktok of the mom uh who's who's um once a week sitting with her kids and asking what makes you happy if you had to be born again would you come back to this family you know just these questions that are challenging the child to actually really think about their life and assess if they're really happy and the mom gets to see if is my child really happy you know um because you only have one childhood and you have these only one set of memories that you create in your childhood so we are moving towards me and I've never been a gentle parent person I've never been gentle yeah because I feel like I don't know but um it's also nice to to feed the emotion and find out what's really happening inside and you kind of um force your children from a young age to be open especially if you have boys to be open about their emotions and speak about what is happening with them you know um because we are having a lot of issues in this country with boys and uh, men suicide and all of that because it's also heavy on them that they can't have an outlet where they can speak about it because it's all about women 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 so i was like okay that's a tip i'll do that so i was doing that with the boys are you happy um you know if you had to choose again would you choose this family uh what is actually exciting about being part of this family you know what would you change really great questions you know i wrote them all down so i mean parenting doesn't come with the bible but we learn we make mistakes and then others are knowledgeable more about it that they can actually write the bible for us <laughs> So yeah, this is called A Spiritual Approach to Parenting: Secrets of Raising the 21st Century Child by Marilyn Barrick.
Okay. And then last lay is no God but God. Egypt and the triumph of Islam. Now, of course, because I'm married to an Egyptian, this is interesting for me. Um, <laughs> you know, African history is very diverse, you know, and it's very complicated, you know. So this is just me trying to understand more about Blanche Telecon. <laughs> so, yeah, um, but yeah, I'm, 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 I'm maybe 20 pages, 25 pages, yeah, into this. So it's, I don't know, I, I can't say it's good or bad yet because I haven't read all of it, but it's by Geneve Abdul. I will let you know how it goes. Um, I will let you know how it goes by the end. But as you know, I'm very opinionated. So some of the things during the first couple of pages, I was like, mm, mm, you know, pinch myself to keep quiet. <laughs> but um, yeah, it should be an interesting read. And that is about it this year that I am hoping to do. By end of December, I should have with most of these books, um, especially the ones that I just bought from the thrift shop, be at least halfway or almost finished, depending on how the holiday is going to be, busy or not. Um, but yeah, just to encourage you guys also to get books that um, you've been always wanting to read. Oh yeah, I want to share with you guys um, books that made a difference in my life. Whoo! I don't have them here, but okay, books that have made a difference in my life. I was in standard two, those days it was standard two, in the earliest 1990s. I was in standard two. And my English teacher, I can still remember her name, Mrs. Irvin. Um, she introduced us to a book called Anne of Green Gables. I was a young girl. I came from the township, from two teacher parents who wanted the best for us because of a apartheid of course we were forced to be there and then um but in the township they still wanted more for us you know they were doing more for us and then once the gates were open for us to start going into model c schools we went I first went into a colored school from my mother was a teacher so I was in her school Elutela and then uh, they opened the a gates for us before 94 of course this is the earliest 90s then I went to a colored school and um, yes yeah, you know just to see fam black families who are so desperate for their children to to to, to know more uh, I remember she's still my friend till this day. Her surname had to, she changed it to an English surname so that she becomes colored. Because you know you can look this way and be colored, right? So she changed her surname so that she could get into the school. My father was so like pro-African none of us have English names she was so he was so um, pro-African he refused to do that we, I got in with my name June don't let me go and um, I was in that school for a year this was meant to um, get some English in me because I didn't obviously know English I was in a, a Zulu school a Bantu school so after that year then I went to Pine Town Convent, which was a private school run by nuns. 
And this is where, in Standard 2, I met this teacher who introduced this book that changed my view of life. Imagine this black girl. I think at that time, I just didn't know because in, in, in Ed Lutella, we didn't read, we didn't do, you know, because you know our schools. But then when I got there, I realized I was that girl who enjoyed the reading, who, who loved the imagination and actually was, you know, a wordsmith kind of, you know. So I won't say wordsmith. I just liked words, okay? <laughs> Because wordsmith sounds like you're this professional uh, speaker, writer, editor, whatever now. I just liked words. I read this book. And the way she would read the book was in a way that I had never heard before. I had I'd never heard anybody read and create this image and picture in your mind. And I was like, wow. And the girl in the book, Anne, she was me photocopied in my mind because she was an orphan, but she was just so resilient, so full of life, questioned everything, stood up for herself. And I was exactly that because I remember my father used to say, don't sing struggle songs in the bus stop when you're going to school. And guess who'd be singing struggle songs in the bus stop waiting for the bus? <laughs> me! And then my cousins would tell on me and my sister. And then um, I'd get the biggest punishment coming back. Because my father, my father felt the same way. But he just didn't want his daughter to get into trouble. And I was all for, you know, justice and whatever. So this Anne of Green Gables was just this character that stood up for herself. You know, she would fight the boys. She would stand up to 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 adults who 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 were not fair to her, said something wrong to her, and and then she she metamorphosized into this beautiful character, and her life changed. And I saw myself. I was like, oh my goodness, this is me. Then after reading this book. So it made a huge mark in my life. And, and I'm going back home to, you know, the township, of course. And I'm in this environment, this private school, and I just cannot relate. But to me, it was a symbol of this could be my life one day. So we then watched the, after we finished reading the book, we then watched the, the video of it the series oh my gosh the character i'll put it up here the character this the, this act this actress um at the time i think she was 17 or 18 and now she's about 54 or 51 or something like that i love it a bit uh because of what she did with taking that character and putting her to life in exactly the same way that I had imagined it, right? So that was my first book that I was like, that's it. I love reading. You know, I love reading. Then my second book that I read that made a huge difference in my life was definitely Frank McCourt, Angela's Ashes. I'll also put it up here. This is also another true story. Um, of course, it's fictional. Um, Anne of Green Gables is fictional. It's a series in books. Um, but Frank McCourt is an Irish, Scottish, I think, Irish-American author. Um, this book is his real life when he was in Ireland. Oh, my gosh. It's heavy. It is so heavy it's like this book that i told you about that it was heavy that that uh that i read where is it it's like this one okay because maybe it's real life and sometimes when you read real life stories and you see that this is actually real it affects you more you know so oh angela's ashes it touched me also in a way because 
again, I came from a background of dodging bullets. I remember during apartheid, we used to go under our beds where we stayed because we had to leave at Clermont and go to Amashu because Clermont was just becoming too much with the unrest. Then we went to Amashu and stayed at, um, at the time, what was it called? It was called um, Subsidin. My subsidy is like I must subsidize people who are professional, like your teacher, your nurse, your police, or whatever. Professional people stayed there. So they called the area in my subsidy. Uh, but it was still just basically glamorized four rooms. And um, we would dodge bullets. I remember my mom, and my dad would be like, go under the bed, and there would be pow pow MC and IFP fighting. And then Kupu Kupu, next door neighbor, neighbor, the cops have come to get him. I remember there was a time I, my father, they they had, they had came and got him. For You know, as a child, you're looking all of this in the background of apartheid. You're growing up and you're just in hardship, you know. Even though you're better off because, of course, you, you have professional parents and you have certain small privileges in comparison to your other black um, neighbors and stuff like that. But um, it was still, for me, everything was just mushed into one. I felt like all of this, even things that were happening around me was just all my life, you know? And I remember in the process of my parents wanting me to learn English, uh, uh, one of my mom's pe uh, friends, she was a domestic worker who, who, who was a stay-in domestic worker, and her daughter stayed with her because the people there, um, if in Lent in Durban, allowed her to stay with her daughter. So her daughter's English was good. And my mom looked at this and was like, I want this for my daughter. So I went and I stayed there. But of course, the white people, they would not allow me to just stay there because who am I? So I would stay in the servants' quarters 24-7, hiding in the bunk bed, the top part of the bunk bed because it was there against the window and if you come in through the front door of the servants quarters the bed was just far off there at the back by the window and you wouldn't see so i would hide there and um they would bring me food and that you know that time reading was my life because i could escape so that whole experience for me when i read angela's ashes frank mccourt the suffering he went through in the Irish background, it really did give me hope about life, honestly, because the guy is white and they're living in so much poverty. I was not poor. Um, I was just a black person in South Africa made to be poor, whether you liked it or not, whether you were educated or not, you are made to be poor. Poor in spirit, poor in the surrounding circumstances, because you're forced to. Because I know that uh, if my mom and dad had the option, we would probably be living elsewhere and be more prosperous, you know, as far as our physical environment. So I, I read Frank McCourt's, I read that book three times. Actually, more than three times. Because I remember the last time I read it, I was in... Um, I was doing my teacher's qualification, my age route. You know? It's just a book that made such a huge difference in me. The suffering that is in there. You know? The reality that was in there. And I found out, we'll see, white people could also suffer. Why people also oppress each other? I have hope, you know? 
And then the last hook, without getting deeper, is The Great Gatsby. <laughs> The Great Gatsby, I, I I just enjoyed it because it just gave me joy. I, I just loved it. I was older when I read The Great Gatsby, um, but it was just one book that it didn't do much in Jay, like emotionally and internally, but it, it just uh, grew my love for reading, you know. Um, I was always excited reading it. I always wanted to read more and more, and it really made me just become love reading okay so yeah those are the top three books that made a mark in me there's more but i think this video is long enough and i've shared a lot more than i wanted to share but anyway guys thank you for listening uh, rambling i'm sure it was a little bit boring because this is not a vlog uh, but i just wanted to share since it's almost the end of the year just to share the books that have um, made an impact in my life this year and in other years and um, also just encourage you to pick up a book and read because it is fundamental cheers guys i will see you in the next video don't forget to like subscribe and make sure you watch my other videos especially the one after this one okay bye